Greetings, everybody. This is Christopher Messina coming at you from the Messy Time Studios on a beautiful warm day in Florida on the 19th of July, 2022. I'm joined from across the equator by Mark Saxon, who's joining us from Melbourne, Australia. So we're here in Melbourne, Florida. He's in Melbourne, Victoria. <laughs> uh, he's the CEO and president of Dallion Resources and Aguila Copper Corp. Uh, Mark, you know, thanks so much for coming on the show. Chris, great to uh, have a chat, and um, I'll, I'll correct you one one little bit there. So I actually live in in the town of Bendigo. So uh, I guess anyone listening that knows the Fosterville Gold Mine. So uh, I'm about 15 kilometres from the Fosterville Gold Mine, sort of in the in the golden heart of, uh, of Central Victoria. Excellent. Pardon, par pardon my my urban centric bias. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> it's like saying I, I you know I, I work in Nevada gold fields, but I might as well be in Las Vegas. Okay. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. My bad. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I was prompted, you know, we've known each other for quite a while, back and forth from kind of PDAC and a bunch of mining venues. Um, and I was struck by something that uh, uh, you had commented on uh, on an online board a little while ago, just about sort of mining finance and the, the, the hard road it is to develop capital for mines. And certainly I've experienced that. And maybe, you know, I'd be curious to hear why in your experience, kind of raising capital for mining operations is so, kind of so much more different than it is for like software or hardware or even automotive manufacturing. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, there's many parts to that conversation. And so uh, I guess um, if I look back in my career and I've, yeah, I've had a very fortunate career, I've just recently turned 50. So uh, I've Happy had about birthday. 30 years in the industry and, um, and uh, yeah, so I've seen plenty of cycles and ups and downs and I've worked in lots of different metals and, and I guess, uh, but I, I guess I really cut my teeth, I suppose, in the rare earth industry. And so um, I was involved uh, or I was CEO of a company that made a, a fairly major discovery in Sweden in uh, 2009, which was, I guess, the start of that rare earth boom. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And before that, I'd been in base metals and gold and, and everything else. And I, I guess um, when I came into rare earths, I had this, this mindset that these materials are so important. Um, they're so techno technologically relevant. Um, we had all of that conflict and the issues between Japan and China. We had US studies. I, I sat on a few panels with, um, with people from NATO and uh, in Europe. It just seemed so important. Then... Mm -hmm. I kind of felt, gee, how hard can it be to, to raise money? And, and even in that circumstance, the answer was still very hard. Like um, uh, we had a project that was kind of ready to move forward and we weren't able to sort of get it across the line in, in a time frame. And so we sort of had to go back around the cycle again in terms of PAs and PFSs and, and wait again for the next sort of mining window. So it was a hard lesson and, and taught me a lot, I guess, um, about even when you have an important project, even when you have things that are critical and, and we're back in that kind of frame again, I guess, in the mining industry is that we've got criticality of, of lithium and cobalt and rare earths and graphite. Um, even when you've got critical materials, um, there's no easy pathway to, to find the money you need to move it. Yeah. Well, you just mentioned a couple of things which would be helpful to elaborate on uh, since a lot of our listeners are gene generically interested in raw and uh, rare, mm. uh, rare earths and raw uh, and resources extraction, yeah. but you mentioned PAs and PFSs. Those are stages for for kind of capital raising, mm. right? Or what, maybe you can elaborate on that a bit. Yeah, for sure. And, and so, um, you know, where, when you you look at a project, and in fact, yeah, I've got a great example of speaking to a friend a few days ago about this. Um, a uh, a mining project, I guess, you go from uh, from knowing nothing or knowing very little about a project, and we'll call that a grassroots stage, where you, you don't have drill holes, you don't have much data, you don't, you don't have a resource in the ground, you really haven't found anything. You move from the grassroots stage, and yeah, let's imagine now our, our company is valued at uh, $5 million. Um, we then drill some holes and we get a first indication, and, um, and so that's sort of early discovery stage, and, and maybe companies valued at $10 million. Um, we then drill more holes and we, we start to sort of firm up and say that, okay, there's something of interest here. Um, we drill 20 holes. Um, and so, okay, our company's getting bumped up to sort of a $25 million valuation and people are getting interested. Um, we then uh, drill enough holes to get a resource. And so the resource is where we, where we can join up the dots underground, let's say, so that we know there is a body of rock down there that, that may be a mine one day. Um, and we're starting to put the put a shape around it and that's where we get a resource. Um, but that's not telling us about 
it's economics. And so we then move into what's called a, a PEA, which is a um, preliminary economic assessment. And so that's really a, um, an early stage calculation of, of uh, the, the value of the rock in the ground, um, how we're going to process it, where we access it, where we're going to get the infrastructure and people from, but very, very broad brushstrokes. It's, it's an example of a project rather than a real project. Um, we then move to a PFS and uh, the PFS is a lot more detailed. And so, yeah, we're, we're kind of imagining a PEA might cost a company a quarter of a million dollars. Um, uh, a PFS will cost two million dollars. So it's kind of 10 times more engineered and, and um, yeah, more knowledge. So that really is a preliminary feasibility study. Like now we're going to spend money to say, okay, is, is this worth it? The, your body, or body might be the richest thing mm -hmm. in the world. But if it's a thousand miles from the nearest railhead and it's over mountains like this in New Guinea, yeah, exactly. Yep. <laughs> maybe, yeah, maybe exactly. I can't get and, it out. Right. Um, yeah, exactly, and and exactly the same. And, and you can imagine the best example is is the same body of rock, the same resource that sits at ten meters depth has very different economics to that body of rock sitting at five hundred meters depth. Right. Um, at ten meters depth, yes, it's probably going to be economic. Um, at 500, maybe not, because you've got to spend a lot of capital up front to, to get down there and, and um, yeah, the logistics are quite different. Yeah. Um, so the PFS kind of gives you the opportunity to sort of do a few trade-off studies, um, open pit versus underground, processing versus shipping, um, scale of the operation, all those things. And you kind of then come up with one example of the project, which you push forward then through into a definitive feasibility study or a DFS. And that's where you're, you're starting to use yeah, really hard numbers, short lookouts. You'll be getting um, quotations from uh, suppliers of chemicals and of mining equipment, and, and you'll be getting robust numbers. And once your DFS is finished, you're then kind of got a document, depending on the quality, but you have a document that goes to a bank and, uh, and says, yeah, will you debt finance this? And yeah, how are we going to do the, the structuring? And, um, and of course, at the same time, you've got a permitting um uh, a role of permitting moving forward at the same time so as you've got your economics moving forward you've got your permitting as well and and uh, yeah you can't guarantee either of them there's still risk in both of those things until you get all the way through to sort of a decision to mine when you've got all your bits of paper in hand and all uh, you know where your money's coming from you know your permits and all that's a very long process i think the biggest thing that i found surprising is having raised capital for sort of traditional trading businesses or or you know much more liquid sort of hedge fund opportunities yeah. and then having worked in the mining space for years is getting investors to understand this is a much longer time horizon mm -hmm. right there there are, there are many oh, years are going to happen absolutely uh, absolutely and it um and it shocks people and uh, and so yeah i think the current estimates sort of somewhere 10 to 15 years from that from that first drill hole in the ground when you say okay this is interesting through to a mine um you kind of in that sort of 10 to 15 um window uh year window so um over that time frame and if if you think back on my career for example of, of 30 odd years then the number of cycles of metal prices during that period um have been really dramatic so um there's times when you can raise money and you can drill holes and you can get work done and there's times when it's utterly impossible so oh, well i have i have to break in with my observation has been of the of the fairly large end of investors i've spoken with the singular dumbest question anyone asks me when we're talking about, say, raising money for a nickel project or a rare earth mm -hmm. project, whatever it is, that will, that even after you've done a huge amount of drilling and resource definition and all that, right? Now you really are at the, give me money, we're building a mine stage. And mm -hmm. the fastest, we'll get material out of this hole in the ground in four years, right? That's fast. Mm -hmm. yeah. My favorite dumb question is, what's the nickel price today? Yeah. Yep. Who cares exactly. what the nickel price is today? It's irrelevant to something that's going to, A, open in four years, reach maximum production in nine years, and hopefully have a life of mine of mm. 40 years, right? Yeah. But it's, it's, it's kind of like knee-jerk reaction that investors who want to like sound smart, and I don't mean that in a bad way, it's just mm. they're trying to get a grip, but like it's, it's so counter-cyclical. The moment mm. you should throw money at me for my cobalt mine, is the moment when cobalt prices are in the tank and there's oversupply. Yeah, ab absolutely. I, I agree with that completely. And and uh, it's it's the idea, I suppose, that um, a lot of investors don't really differentiate between exploration and mining. So at the at the mining yeah, for a mining company, absolutely, metal prices matter. 
um, because yeah, they've, they've got revenues yeah, in, in every quarter. So it does actually make a difference. But for an exploration company, like for example, the, um, the, one of the companies I'm CEO of, yeah, Aguila Copper Corporation, we're obviously a copper exploration company. Um, yeah, great projects and, and lots going on. However, yeah, our production timeline is, yeah, is plus five years out. Right. So, um, yeah, so should our share price go down because the copper price goes down? Absolutely not. They're, they're really not connected in a sensible time frame. Yes, they do. Like those things aren't connected. Yes, so they do. Um, <laughs> yeah, which, uh, and, and so suddenly you get 50 articles that you see about how, uh, how terrible copper is and, and how demand is going to slow for six months or 12 months. Um, prices might ease. Big deal. It makes no difference at all to the work we're doing but it does affect our ability to finance. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's the problem is that, um, yeah, that cyclical nature of prices sucks a whole lot of investors out of the industry um, or it burns investors. And suddenly they, they don't believe what they're investing in. They think they're in the wrong sector and they say, yeah, all right, I'm gonna do software again. And yeah, at least I can, at least that happens quickly. So um, we, we, we do burn investors. It's not the fault of the companies, it's the fault of that cycle that and a bit of an unrealistic expectation. It's interesting because it really proves kind of Benjamin Graham's thesis about, and Warren Buffett has made himself a billionaire multiple times over on the premise that if you believe in the company yesterday when prices were high and prices drop, the news cycle should actually be utterly inverted. You should yep. say, great, I can buy more shares of this for less money. How awesome yep. is that? And yet human nature is just, they, they, they flip from thing, thing to thing like a hummingbird. And it's it's part of the conversation we try to have with our investors because I'm involved in both kind of a big rare earth project mm. as well as a big nickel project. Um, and those investors get it, right? You're going to look at, you know, the primary number they should focus on is mm. what is your, either if you're in production, what is your you know average cost of production per whatever unit of metal versus, or what's your projected likely average cost over time? Mm -hmm. And then you can judge that against various models of Monte Carlo simulations and various price tests. Mm. That makes sense, right? Prices do matter. But in that weird sort of completely non-intelligent, non-useful kind of point in time, what's the price question? Mm. Um, and to me, that's just a, that's a market education issue, right? It's just yeah, yeah, exactly. you're, if you're selling your exploration yeah. stock because the price of copper went down. I can't mm -hmm. help you. Like, I don't know why yeah. you're doing that. Either you believe that this team has found something. And mm. part of what I love explaining to folks, what I first loved about getting into the industry was I love talking to exploration geologists because they're the most optimistic bunch of people on the planet, right? Mm. Over the next hill is going to be yeah. the best thing anyone ever found ever. And I just need yeah. money to put a drill in it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And yeah, you, you need that sense of optimism. Otherwise, you really can't do your job. And, and so if you meet a, a pessimistic geologist, then uh, they're, they're probably out of the business, I would say, doing something else because... Yeah. Um, or they're a mining they're engineer, really right? The, I yeah, love the geos exactly. who are like, great, you've told me this thing is awesome. The investors mm -hmm. gave us money. Now you go away while we figure out if we can make money off this thing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then the mining engineers will complain that you didn't find the right ore body or, yeah, it's too remote or it's too difficult to process. And, right. It's and, cold um, here and lots of mosquitoes. I hate it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes. You should have found it somewhere else. And and I guess, uh, yeah, we, we have that good good example, I guess, and, and coming back to the Rare Earth Project in Sweden. And, uh, um, yeah, you, you know the project well. And, yeah. And, um, it's uh, it's in uh, within the catchment of a uh, of, of a major lake, and um, and so we had uh, many conversations in Sweden about um, uh, with stakeholders and partners. Why couldn't you have found found it somewhere else? And, um, <laughs> I would love to have it under my own and, and building. Yeah, my answer is always okay. Yes, I, I would have liked to have found it an extra five kilometers away from the lake. That would have been great. Right. Um, but if I'm going to move it, then why don't I move it to Estonia or Poland, where where the cost of labour is a little bit cheaper? Uh, um, yeah, let's yeah, you can play that game forever, and so um, uh, yeah, you can only um, play the hand that nature has dealt us in terms of exploration discovery where we're working, and uh, yeah, absolutely not everywhere is right for a mine, um, and so yeah, every geologist. I think is uh, is environmentalist at heart as well, and oh, yeah. we all came out of wanting to to work in the mountains and meet people in remote areas, and 
Um, certainly that was, uh, most people I meet in geology came from that background. So we're, we're not there to sort of destroy the environment. We're there to, um, yeah, to, to see if we can actually contribute to society, produce metals that society needs. Um, and so we're not trying to, to kill the environment in the same place. And so we absolutely accept that not everywhere is right for mining, but that has to be data-driven decisions. It can't just be, yeah, I've got a nice house. Yeah, there's some some wealthy people that live in that area that live next to lakes. Um, so therefore, it's not right for mining. It, it's got to be data-driven and it's got to be objective. And, and um, yeah, sometimes it's a yes, sometimes it's a no. That's fine. There's uh, no problem. Yeah. My, my, one of my favorite stories, which will remain slightly anonymous, was from an executive who's now retired, uh, but was one of the big mining companies. And they had a um, exploration division in Bordeaux. Right now, how good is that? Right? Would you yeah, like to an be awesome. yeah. an exploration geo living in Bordeaux? Yeah. And so they came to do a tour. They're very excited. They found some tremendous deposits, wonderful deposits, right? But the problem was one of them was sitting directly under a 13th century monastery that was a UNESCO <laughs> yeah. heritage site. One was yeah. under a Grand Cru vineyard. It was like ridiculous. Yeah. You know, yeah. and they said, well, you know, they've been mining here since, since Roman times. Yes, they have. And now mm -hmm. real estate is worth millions of dollars per square inch. Yeah. So we're not building a mine here. Yeah. And and you've got to, yeah, companies need to be sensible. And, and um, yeah, because if people are out doing things in areas that, that can never be mined or projects that can never be mined, it, it does, it, it drags capital away from good companies. Yeah. Um, yeah. Companies doing real things. And so that's a problem. But it just makes the whole industry look bad. And, and those things are then used as examples in the future about, yeah, I don't trust you because there was this, yeah, 10 years ago, we had this bunch of idiots doing this, this uh, stupid work in some other place. And, and there's examples of that all around the world, oh, places right. where should have ne never re received investment. And, and yet people are sort of, yeah, there's an Australian term that I, I won't use that I can I can think of, but um, <laughs> yeah, that, that really never had a chance. So um, yeah, so we shouldn't be working on those projects as an industry. And, uh, so what's what's um, in general, you know, for folks who are thinking about this, who um, either haven't been part of the mining cycle ever, or are, are thinking about it, because there's you know, I certainly speak to a lot of people who know that I've been you know yelling about critical minerals and rare earths for a decade, and finally right. it's become topical, right? So now they're hearing it from someone else, so maybe you know. Maybe Messina wasn't completely absurd. Um, mm. You know, what do you say when people kind of ask you rationally, like, what should I actually be looking for if I am? Yeah. And again, this is not for the well, it's either for the retail punter, I guess, is looking at you know a venture stock, yeah. or for an institutional investor who's got really serious you know capital to invest. You know, what yeah. do you tell them that you, they, the metrics by which they should judge this? Because obviously, sales are mm. going to hit them with the best story ever. Yeah, I'm sure. Like, and that um, gap and listen. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, I guess fundamentally, and the one that I tell most people, and I, like when I, I market, I tend to market the sector that I'm working in as much as I'm marketing an individual company, I suppose. And, and so for, for investors, I guess the, the key thing is just understand what you're investing in. Mm -hmm. um, so understand, um, I guess, the, the different, it's, it's easy to buy a share and you can do that with a click of a button. It takes us all yeah, no more than five minutes. Um, but it takes quite a long time to really understand and go through the layers of decision making to get to the right place. Um, and, and I hope my companies are the right place, but if they're not, that's fine too, because I um, having investors that don't understand what they're doing, they're going to be sellers at, at the worst possible time as well. So um, yeah, you don't really want the wrong shareholders, I guess. So um, I guess, first of all, and, and to think about the companies that I'm involved with, they're yeah, very much exposed to that critical materials story. Um, so yeah, I guess the, the first thing we can look at is um, is one of the big things that are happening in the world at the moment and, and what's going to be driving markets and economies over the next 10 years. Okay, we're, we're talking at the moment about security of supply. We're talking about um, shorter supply chains. Um, we're talking about um, strong ESG themes. We're talking about electrification. We're talking about um, decarbonisation. Um, okay, so that that's metrics that you, you kind of understand. And so, all right, so next question is how do you, what, what markets do those big themes influence? So we can look at um, yeah, development of, of new wind technology or solar technology or other renewables. We can look at hydrogen, we can look at fuel cells, um, we can look at batteries, we can look at EVs. And so all different ways of, of playing that theme. But I guess at the next layer down below that, fundamentally all of those new technologies require um, lots and lots of new materials. 
Um, and so that's where it starts to impact on us in the mining industry. So it's changing, I guess, the shift of, of demand in, um, in terms of the materials that are required. So we can look backwards by, by five or six years. Lithium was, was used in a small amount of, of glass products. It was used in medicine and was used a tiny amount in, in lithium batteries that we were we knew which were, were tiny and, and um, yeah, had limited use. So the, the market for lithium was very small. Looking forwards, the market for lithium is massive. So um, yeah, it's a complete shift because of the technology that we're, we're now using as a shift. And so we can look at that for a whole range of different things. And graphite's another great example that, yeah, graphite was a very dull material used in the steel industry and used in, in crucibles that, that hold, um, yeah, hot melted metals because it's inflammable. Looking forward, um, hugely exposed to the battery market. Um, and so it's a, at, at a much, much higher value as well. So um, yeah, un understand that, that um, yeah, those big market forces and then see where it impacts. At the first level is, is I guess, those finished products. The second level is the mined materials. Um, so yeah, that's, that's top level. So yeah, let's, let's take that through and say, copper electrification needs an awful lot of copper. We've, we've got to double the amount of copper that's produced over the next sort of 10 years. And I think we're, we're talking, I think something like until 2050, um, we need as much copper between now and 2050 as ever been mined in the history of the world. So we're talking really big numbers. So it needs a, a major focus. So we've, we've filtered down from EVs, wind energy, all that stuff. Okay, we're filtered now down to copper. Um, okay, so where do the major copper mines exist in the world? We've got, um, yeah, we've got, uh, Chile, we've got Peru, we've got Congo, we've got Arizona, we've got um, Central Canada, we've got yeah a whole range of places there, um, and then from that filter down into the companies that are working in those areas, and and then start to look particularly at the teams involved and the people, and uh, can they raise the money? Can they make progress? Um, quality of the projects, and um, and I guess again it comes down to junior companies versus or yeah, explorers versus miners. Um, they involve a whole different set of people. Um, yeah, so I, I come from an exploration background. Um, and so when you look at companies, I guess, yeah, let's say sub 10 million, sub 15 million. Um, so they're not really getting much value for their projects um, at those levels. So if, you're, if you've got a, a $10 million company or a $5 million company, um, there's not much value in the projects. What you're valuing is the people. So you've got to spend more time knowing the people, knowing that they're actually people who can build a company and find something and take it from $5 million to $50 million. Um, when you look at mining companies, the, the dynamics are really quite different. And, and so, yeah, you need great teams in those big companies. You've got yeah, so many layers in a mining company that, uh, that need protecting. It's a, um, it's a big network and yeah, you need a great CEO, but um, you need a great, you then look at the mining economics as well. And that's a whole different set of skills and um, yeah. The, the margins on that uh, on that business. Yeah, it, it's helpful. I think it's also interesting um, from an American context. What I, what I came to realize is, as a proud member of the New York Coal Trade, Coal Trade Association, um, <laughs> yeah. funnily enough, for for a long time, uh, Americans American natural resource investors tend to be oil and gas focused or coal focused. There's yeah. always been some mining in this country, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. But it was, it was the more I got to understand kind of the global mining investor universe, they tended predominantly to be Australian, Canadian, South African, you know, yep. uh, UK based, at least the Anglophone yeah. uh, investors, sure. big, big European investors, obviously Belgium, France, yeah. Germany. Uh, but what was what's most interesting about that sort of dynamic is that um, combined with, of course, the American tradition of, uh, as Mark Twain put it, his definition of a gold mine was a hole in the ground with a liar on top, right? Yeah. So I think there's always this native uh, uh, suspicion of yeah. something that is not not particularly uh, proven. Of course, Briex and the, the changing standards of how you actually define resources has helped, yeah. but um, it's it's still a very odd conversation to start, right? I mean, a, a typical yeah. example, this, yeah. this is absolutely perfect sort of illustrative, I think, of, of the cultural difficulties are, I was at a, a New York tech meetup a few years ago, it's this monthly thing yeah. where they talk about technology. Anyway, it was, a, it was a design competition about autonomous vehicles and how cities would change, right? But that's not the important yeah. part. It was yeah. 
the, part of the whole New York Tech meetup thing, if you haven't done it, is at the break, you have to introduce yourself to two people you haven't met before, right? So yeah. it's a networking thing. Mm. Okay. The yeah. woman sitting next to me who's been cheering for this one team, right? She's from a, from a, mm. a university in New York. We get to chatting. She is a professor of industrial design. Okay, now this is important. She's not a professor professor of comparative French poetry. She's a professor of industrial design. Hmm. And she says to me, what do you do? I said, well, I invest in mining companies. And she said, how do you sleep at night with that? I said, well, we (laughs) create hundreds of thousands of jobs and we create hundreds of billions of dollars in tax revenue. And we provide Hmm. all the things, including the thing you're holding in your hand and most Hmm. half of the material that's held up this building. I sleep Hmm. like a baby. Yeah. Right. But what was amazing was in New York, of course, that was a revolutionary statement. Yeah. No one had ever said that to her before. It was a given that mining is bad. Mm. And it was just so incredibly strange. Mm. I I asked, like, where the materials that you suggest your, your, your students use? Yeah. Where do they come from? To her enormous credit, she kind of laughed at herself. She said, you know what? You're right. They got to come from somewhere. And it's kind of obnoxious of me to assume they're going to happen in some other country somewhere. But Mm. that prevailing knee-jerk attitude of Mm. there's something wrong with... Oh, and and it it prevails equally to today. There's no... um, Yeah, that that hasn't gone away. And and, yeah, bad mining is bad. So, and it comes back to that idea that... um, Yeah, I suppose there's two measures of that. So, So, first of all, I guess what we really want is uh, is highly economic, well-run mines, um, so highly profitable mines. And so a very good mine is able to pay from open to closure all the way through, fix up all the environmental issues that it created and the, the change of, of landscape and things. It can yep. and So that when, when the mining company leaves, um, yeah, the site, visibly it's a little bit different, but um, yeah, there's no- Money's come back, and keep hopping. <laughs> yeah, and so- um, yeah, and there's there's zero impact off the mine site, which which I think is very important. So yeah, good mining is is like that. And what we don't want is those those mines that sit on the margin of of profitability. So um, yeah, they make a bit, they lose a bit, they make a bit um, because in a tough market, there's a, a good chance they go bankrupt, um, and those mines will end up in the hands of government. There'll be there'll be a legacy. There'll be a dirty site. There'll um, there'll be unpaid bills everyone gets a bad taste in their mind. And so, yep. um, yeah, that we, we need to focus on having, yeah, having better quality minds, I guess. But I, I suppose, yeah, and I'm sure, yeah, certainly for me in Australia, um, as a kid, you used to drive around sort of old mining districts that are interesting areas, um, yep. a lot of history there, but there was always a bit of a legacy there of, yeah, changed landscapes, damaged landscapes, um, where, where things hadn't been done properly. But often we're talking 100 years ago. And so um, to compare what was happening in the mining industry 100 years ago to today just makes zero sense. We don't, we don't do that with communications or, yeah, or transport. We don't say, yeah, we don't kind of compare those two things and, and expect it to be the same. Of course no. we don't. In fact, even looking back 10 years, like um, the, the um, amount of monitoring and of, um, of what's going on in the mine site is, is utterly incredible. Even over the last ten years, we can. There is nothing that we can't monitor in real time um, and uh, and understand if a problem is going to occur. And yeah, I know there's been some some problems with tailing stamps failures and things. We can't escape that as an industry. But um, those those issues are really diminishing, certainly for a well-funded mine, because you can monitor all of that stuff. And uh, so I, I guess, and to take that that thought a little bit further, and coming back to my rare earth experience, so I I met. In Europe at that time, um, yeah, sort of the procurement teams of, uh, of many, many major companies. Um, it was a very uh, regular part of my business because rare earths were in, in short supply. It was entirely Chinese sourcing. Um, and so I had a meeting with, um, uh, with a very major company. Um, yeah, anyone listening will know the name, uh, household name, um, with uh, yeah, six PhDs sitting around the table. And we had a, a bit of a conversation about rare earths, and and it um, and I just asked the question about where do you buy your your rare earths and your your metals from today? Which mine? I guess was my my question. Um, and the answer that came back to me was, we don't buy metals from mines. 
we buy them from traders. And so they never really made the connection about sort of where the metals are actually coming from, uh, that they're buying stuff from the mining industry. And, uh, and and this is yeah this would be a top ten consumer of of sure. metals and materials globally and uh, um, and they never looked past the trader they never really understand understood where things were coming from and so that became a crisis um, yeah and the Germans um, love the idea of supply chain redundancy so um, so if one of their suppliers fails there's always somebody else that can uh, can step in so that they I think it's uh it's 40, 20, 20, 10, 10 is kind of how they want to divide up the supply chain. Um, so if the if the 40% supplier fails, the 20% one can expand into that space. Um, they found with rare earths was that even though they had different traders providing materials, uh, sitting behind the traders, the exact same source, literally one mine. They were all right. buying from the, <laughs> the same one mine in China, and uh, and that kind of horrified them. And yep. um, to think they'd spent all this sort of yeah brain power and knowledge to um to try to get a robust supply chain and in fact it was all coming back to a single source and that's where they kind of had a panic and were looking for alternatives but but then um yeah for for our work and for many other companies um because rare earths hadn't been valued appropriately before that 2009 crisis right. nobody was out looking for them nobody was spending money on exploration so they only sort of dropped on the map at that sort of 2009, 2010 period. And uh, um, yeah, we, yeah, you, you may know someone like uh, James Dines who was writing about it at that stage. And um, yeah, sort of the, the rare earth crisis that that we saw a small tick up in price and uh, which turned into a, a panic uh, very, very quickly. Yeah, no, it's funny because with our, with our mine in Greenland, we're having the same discussions mm. and it has just been astonishing to me to speak to industrial mm. and buyers, smart people, right? Yeah. And same sort of thing, we're buying for traders, and I've been trying to explain calmly without right kind of kind of your hair begins to get on fire because it's, it drives you so crazy me anyway um but hey never mind the fact that the Chinese decided since Deng Xiaoping that rarest were going to be their monopolistic industrial interest yeah. and that's fine and, and I, I perhaps pointlessly but kind of uh uh divide the world's world of competition up into kind of moral just moral competition and immoral Immoral mm. is claim jumping, bribing officials, stealing material, yeah. right? All that stuff. Yeah. But kind of solid moral competition in my mind, the Chinese have been phenomenal. They have poured billions of dollars into education. They produce hundreds of PhDs in material science every year, mm. right? They've invested and given tax credits to their manufacturing uh, uh, enterprise within the country. To me, that's yeah. fair competition. You're, you're allowed to do that, right? Yeah. Um, so what I tried to really drive home to these to these industrial buyers is it's not even going to be a matter anymore of whether you're willing to pay more. The Chinese, without any political interference, their mm. internal economy is about to require all of their production. Yeah. So it's, it doesn't even have to be kind of mercantilist policy anymore. Mm. Just the drivers of sheer economics are going to mean that they are going to consume all the rarest they produce and more. They're already mm. importing more. And yeah. what has been kind of astonishing to me is the continued kind of head in the sand approach of, well, we'll figure it out. What are you going to figure out? Like, I know yeah, yeah. where you're buying from. Mm. They're not going to be selling to you anytime soon. Or No, that's right. No, no. And then I guess the real, the real difference of what we do sort of in yeah, Australia, US, Europe, is that um, uh, a, a tendency has has been to cut the supply chain into small pieces. Mm. Um, and yeah, the, uh, yeah, coming back to my German experience, the, the Germans, the Germans love that because it, it creates that, that tier system of suppliers. And in that tier system, you end up with lots of sideways competition. Um, and so that gets the best technology development and it gets the best prices. However, um, in, in something like rare earths, you end up with a whole lot of weak players um, versus Chinese suppliers who then have a vertical integration. And the vertical integration means that, okay, for a, a period you're losing money at one point, but you're making money at another point. And so the whole thing works out over the longer term. Yep. Whereas yep. Yeah, our, our way of business is, okay, let, let the poor ones die and, and somebody else will fill. But maybe you know, nobody fills the gap. If the business isn't healthy enough or strong enough or we can't get investors, Nobody fills that gap. And, and that's kind of what's happened in rare earth metals is that um, 
uh, the the prize hasn't been big enough to attract investment and and um, and focus on some of those sectors over the long term. Um, whereas in the Chinese market, yes, the prize has been big enough because it's part of a stronger business. And so, as you say, um, the, the the mining company is going to sell to a to a, a partner or a, yeah, even the same ownership to a processing company is going to sell to a magnet company is going to sell to a components company is going to sell to an automotive company that are all within the same ownership structure and, and maybe it's centralized and, yeah. and, and they'll pass with the, the profit price. and losses around to make sure transfer pricing works and they'll end up dominating the market yeah, uh, exactly yeah. it's a lesson yeah. that hopefully we can learn here i see some glimmers of it um and i do think that there will be there will be some some players who are going to make that leap but they're mm. taking longer and they're moving more yep. slowly and um which is it's funny having come from a trading background Time, the time value of money is burned into my soul, right? Like if the yeah. opportunity is mm. here, take it. Um, yeah. Versus the number of times I've heard, well, I'd like to see how that develops. Say, well, you're going to watch it develop and it's going to develop away from you. You're going to lose. Yeah, but somebody else. You yeah, watch right. it enjoy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's the benefit of somebody else. And uh, and I, yeah, we, we've seen some, I guess, throwaway comments from Elon Musk on, on lithium and, oh, we're going to buy a lithium mine, which, um, yeah, like to a point, I understand where he where he gets to that thinking, and and um, at least he's thinking about it. So uh, yeah, acknowledge that. I always hold it not yeah. not just about Elon, but about anyone in his position who has said something to the press like, "Well, if this continues, we're going to be forced to invest in mines." Great, yeah. good, yeah. come do it, come come, great, wonderful. Yeah. You've been forced, have you? Wonderful. I'll <laughs> yeah. send you a yes, exactly. Yeah. Right, cricket. Yeah. We've got so nothing, so we've got to go. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, and, and maybe it takes things like that to get, get mining on the map again to show that where the materials actually come from. And um, because, uh, yeah, without without those really big conversations, then there's just not enough money flowing through to our part of the business. Yeah. And, and it was, a, I think it was a Bank of America article last week that was talking about the the shortfall in, in investment in the mining industry. Yes. As if it's... As um, if it's news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as if it's news and, and second enough. of all... As if they're they're blaming the mining industry for not investing enough. Yeah, well, yeah, we would love to be investing more, but um, yeah, there's a limited amount of access to capital in our business. Yeah. It's being shared across, it's been shared end to end from diamonds and gold and silver and rare earth metals and copper and and iron ore and um, yeah, so that pool of money is being shared horizontally across all those different businesses. If um, if the gold price jumps by five hundred dollars tomorrow, um, because of some other crisis or financial issue, then it, it doesn't it doesn't attract new money. It, it's going to suck money away from right. from industrial minerals, or it's going to suck money from rare earths. It's going to suck money from copper. So you'll see selling of those companies and buying of of the gold companies. Um, and so suddenly, a problem that we've already got, but there's not enough investment in in critical materials and industrial metals it set, gets sucked across to a different part of the business and, and we saw that with cannabis i suppose and and oh, so yeah. well, the there, there was quite similar invest investors, in mining yeah. stocks now invest in cannabis yeah. stocks yeah so exactly so the same pool base yep the same pool of investors yeah that that your your retail investors got two thousand dollars to spend on a speculative investment they're seeing a cannabis stock and a mining stock as being equals from their point of view and they've got right. risk profiles that are not unlike each other right. but um yeah in in terms of um their importance to society and their importance to decarbonization um yeah a mining company sits in a very different place to a, a cannabis investment so um yeah they they're really not the same so um yeah they're only the same to the investor who's uh, writing the checks I've got one last question for you. Quick, a quick thought experiment. And I am, sure. as a let's say fair capitalist, I am loath to have government mandate anything, right? Um, but one thing I've noticed is there are massive pools of capital sitting in public pension funds or superannuation funds in Australia, right? Yeah. And it's, it drives, it, for those of us who are looking for capital for earlier stage, well, actually not even earlier stage projects. You well know the one I've got really mm, sure. ready to turn into a mine, right? It's, it's permanent, mm. ready to go right? Um, 
uh, but this is not an advertisement, so I won't. <laughs> uh, but you know, if, if, if I'm so tempted to look at those trillions of dollars of assets of management and say, mm-hmm. if those pension managers said, I'm going to take 0.05% of our assets every year and throw them at mining, mining investments, yeah. not stocks, mm-hmm. mining investments. They're going to put real capital into mining companies. Yeah. Within two years, we'd have a completely overfinanced industry, yeah. right? So I'm not, a, again, I'm not a fan of government mandates because they get distorted and they become politicized. Mm-hmm. But if those pension managers would make that rational decision one by one, right? I'm sitting on, I'm CalPERS, I'm sitting on $4 trillion of assets. Mm-hmm. Why don't I throw $200 million a year at later stage mining mining companies into the ground, mm-hmm. not buying stocks? Yeah. Um, would that be a solution? Would that, I mean, it'd certainly be helpful. Yeah. Would you think there's any appetite yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, I think absolutely. And it's really about how you think about the mining industry. And um, yeah, I was kind of, yeah, as you were talking there, giving a little bit of thought. And um, so if you, if you took away the word mining and you said um, that those same pension funds have to put 0.1% of their, of their assets towards social housing, something like that. Right. Then everyone would say, okay, yeah, social housing, great to good. Yeah, we agree with that, no problems at all. And, and you get a little bit of pushback in areas, but, but essentially it's for the right reasons. And, and so, um, yeah, everybody would, would agree with that. Um, so let's now flip that towards, okay, what's the, what's the biggest problem we're, we're discussing globally at the moment? Decarbonisation and uh, a shift to, to um, energy generation that has less impact. Um, okay, so it's, it, it's a big problem. It's a big social issue, just the same as social housing is. So why, why wouldn't you have that, that kind of guaranteed investment that, um, yeah, it's our money. We want it to be Right. Yeah. Sort of that triple bottom line kind of thinking that, um, yeah, we want to make money off our money, but we also want to be doing good with our money. Then uh, absolutely, that would be a great way to get um, additional investment um, into the industry. Um, I guess the one the one problem, and again, it comes back to that that thinking of the cyclical nature of the business is that um, the skills that sit with inside sort of those pension funds and and, uh, that are allocating funds. Um, they're generalists. They're not really specifically involved in the mining industry because oh, very rarely. that cyclical nature of the mining industry means that analysts have been burnt out and pushed out of the industry. And, and so there's not many mining specialists that sort of sit within those teams. So, and, and I think that creates the, the uncertainty as well that, um, yeah, nobody should invest in stuff they don't understand. And you think about that in the, at the extreme end in those pension funds, they don't have specialists in mining. And so, it's kind of invisible to them. They don't, they're not really thinking down that pathway because they don't have the skills to do it. And, and so they, they stay out of it and they'll, they'll invest mm. instead in Apple and Microsoft and, and GM and yeah, run down the list of all the, yeah, all the big players because it's the safe place to be and um, because they don't have the skills and, and uh, yeah, somebody that comes and tells the boss about investing in a mining company when they've never invested in mining before, it's a hard thing to do. So um, right. yeah, and it comes down again to, misunderstanding of mining and, and lack of skills, I guess, too. Uh, to say oh. now, is there a role for the mining industry? I mean, I know that we've tried in various initiatives, but maybe it's really time for a coordinated education effort, right? I mean, it, it, we think about the amount of money, certainly in the United States, people yeah. get food security, right? <laughs> we, yeah. We've now gotten food security so well that we're obese, right? But mm-hmm. that idea of that it's in yeah. the national interest for the USDA and a various other yeah. but, you know, organs of government to make mm. sure there's always wheat and meat on people's plates. Yes. Yeah. Maybe that's a similar thing that people really need to understand, right? You, yeah, it, and it, certainly when I was in the early part of my career, there was there was um, bumper stickers that used to get given out at conferences was, uh, yeah, it's either grown or, grown or mined. Um, so right. yeah, everything we use is, is from one of those um, two sources. Maybe um, that's a new answer. And, and yeah, so yeah, I, I think that's that's important. And But um, yeah, I guess, um, Disconnecting, I, I guess, the idea of mining is about um, about digging a hole. Um, mining is not about digging a hole. We're we're not there to go and dig a hole for the sake of digging a hole. We're we're there to extract the materials that society needs. That's the entire point of the process. We're not there to destroy the environment and change things and disturb communities. We're there to extract something that that society needs and values and regards as important. Um, if society didn't regard as important, as important, that product that we're trying to extract would have a low value. 
Um, and so there'd be no point doing it. We wouldn't do it. So yeah, disconnect that thinking of mining is about digging holes. In fact, mining is about producing something of high value that, that builds out a supply chain that, that is essential. And, um, and so somehow we've got to change that thinking to, um, yeah, to, to what the materials are rather than the, the hole in the ground that's, that's left behind. I can't put that any better. So we're going to stop on a high note. <laughs> That's absolutely perfect. Sounds I think may, maybe <laughs> history is going to look back in the mining industry and say, "Thank you." That's Thank right. You. This was That's the moment. The okay. This was the pivot point okay. <laughs> for, for hopefully changing, at least opening a couple of eyes. But Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to come on. No, my uh, pleasure, Chris. Great to chat. Yeah. Hope hope we can hope we can spark a bit of a change with this. And uh, to everyone else, please tune in to Messy Times. Turn off the news. They're lying to you. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs>